be live. But hey everyone, welcome to the last session of the conference. So we are with us Sandy Monger, who is currently the VP of Growth and Marketing at Charlie AI. She's a senior product marketing and growth leader with experience in B2B technology startups and scale-ups. She spent the last six plus years focused on product marketing, go to strategy, and growth at software startups and more established organizations like GE Digital. At Charlie AI, her role sits at the intersection of strategy, creativity, data, and product to drive a product like growth strategy forward. It's a pleasure having you on board, Sandy. The stage is yours. Thank you so much for that intro, Gotham, and uh, thank you, SaaS Insider, for hosting this awesome event. Um, so as Gotham mentioned, I've spent a lot of my career in marketing, specifically doing product marketing for B2B SaaS companies. And more recently, um, I learned about product-led growth and all of the um, opportunities that PLG can unlock for marketing teams, product teams, and really your entire company and your entire business. So today I'm gonna to be talking about some of the practical advice I learned along the way from my journey from going from more marketing and sales-led organizations to a product-led organization where we're driving a, a totally product-led go-to-market. Um, before I get started, I actually wanted to uh, kind of poll the audience on how many of you are familiar with PLG. Um, that's probably going to change some of the questions that I ask you uh, throughout the throughout this presentation. So let's take a look. If you could answer the poll question that I think Gotham just uh, launched and let me know. We have someone who says they are on the fence about PNG, one who's in and full, fully PNG. Okay. Do we have a clear winner yet? Not yet. Okay. So it kind of sounds like we've got a mixed bag of an audience here today. Some folks who are uh, thinking about PLG, some folks who are on the fence. Um, so for those of you that are thinking about it and on the fence, I'm hoping by the end of this session, you'll be convinced that PLG is right for you and you might even have some takeaways you can bring back to your team uh, to get started. So um, I wanted to start by posing another question to everyone. Software buying has changed. Um, you can see it and feel it all around you. And um, that's largely due to the way that we as consumers have changed our preferences. So buying behaviors have changed, our expectations of software, even in our work lives and the enterprise have changed. Um, but you have to ask yourself, has your go-to-market changed and has your product changed alongside those changes in user behavior? And that's really the, the question that drives um, why organizations want to adopt product-led growth. It's our users are telling us things that um, we're not reacting to in the right way. Our go-to-markets have to evolve, our products have to evolve in order to meet the user where they are. And so I've noticed some things um, going on this journey from sales-led to product-led. Here are some of the things that I noticed that weren't really working anymore. Um, so as a marketer in a, in a heavy sales led motion, um, we were definitely chasing uh, marketing qualified leads or MQLs kind of blindly. Um, it was our, it was our key metric. And so we would be celebrating wins when we hit our MQL target for that year. But what was happening is we were passing those MQLs along to our sales team and, um, the, the dirty little secret here is that 98% of those MQLs probably never turned into closed business. Um, and uh, that stat comes from a serious decision study that they conducted that found that MQLs just almost never convert the way you expect them to. So that was one thing that I noticed that wasn't working and turns out it's not working for a lot of people. The other was, and this is especially true of startups and scale-ups, 
um, that are starting in more of that B2B space, it can be really alluring to kind of go chase those big deals because oftentimes those big companies have a lot of money, those enterprise accounts are going to, you know, give you the opportunity to do a pilot or a POC and they're going to give you uh, a bunch of dollars, but those dollars come with strings attached. And usually what happens is your roadmap gets over indexed on that big account. And so, you know, depending on your product, that might be a great decision for you. But for a lot of um, bottoms up SaaS companies or SaaS that's building for more of the kind of like broader SMB space or mid market, that can actually be really dangerous because you get into this habit of relying on those accounts to help you drive the product roadmap and product vision instead of really thinking about some of the cooler things like how do I, you know, think about a really frictionless user experience or an awesome user interface or create delight in my product and you become fixated on some of those enterprise requirements. Um, and the last thing I would say is that uh, trying to win over buyers with, you know, thought leadership alone and, and you know, having a great content marketing strategy is a requirement, but having content marketing alone and relying on that to help qualify uh, the, the prospects that come to your website just wasn't working because they didn't have the right expectations of what your product was going to be because there wasn't enough product education happening. So those are some of the things that I noticed that weren't working anymore that made um, me feel like we need to think of a new way to go to market um, at Charlie AI. And, um, you know, early on, there were some uh, misconceptions around PLG that made the, that switch really difficult. And so these are some of the things that you might be thinking about if you're on the fence or if you're, if you're just thinking about PLG, maybe these myths are holding you back, especially if you're a marketer. Um, so you might be thinking, I work with sales every day and PLG seems like it's the antithesis of the sales team. So am I, am I going to have to like blow up my sales team in order to really execute on this go to market? And that doesn't sound like a, a thing I want to do. So that is not correct. And we'll talk about why. Um, the second I've heard is that marketing matters less in a PLG company because product is in the name of the go to market. So of course it must be product management led go to, uh, a go to market. Um, and that's also simply not true. And we'll, we'll talk about why. And then the third is, um, and this I heard a lot from this kind of like C-suite executives and, you know, leadership teams that I spoke to. And it was very much our current go-to-market works fine. We don't need PLG. So it's kind of a if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why that might be changing pretty soon. The truth is that... Um, you know, a lot of these myths are holding us back because we think of things as being black and white. So on the one hand, you have the old sales and marketing game that's a traditional go-to-market that we're all familiar with and it's working great. Um, and then on the other side, there's this, this side, there's this promised land of product-led growth. And what we're taught is, you know, if you're here, you can't be here and you have to make the switch completely. And what I've discovered through our journey at Charlie going from you know the kind of mindset of traditional sales and marketing to product led is that there's a messy middle and that actually a lot of organizations live in this messy middle. Um, what I like to kind of draw the comparison to is Scott Belsky talks about the messy middle from the perspective of founders in the early days of building a company. And there's this period between having the idea and reaching success, and it's the messy middle. And that's where the signs of progress are so faint that you don't even realize that they're there. Um, and I, I could draw the same parallel between making that switch going to product-led growth is in the early days, it will feel like you're not making progress. Um, and it will feel like you know, you're taking a step backwards because you had a machine that was working and you were churning out these MQLs and now you're doing something new. And I just want to say that in the messy middle, there, there are some, you know, negotiations you can make. It's uh, if you have a killer sales team, you're not getting rid of them, you're retraining them. In the messy middle, if you, um, you know, don't 
necessarily have the economics to support a fully freemium or free trial product, you might try something like a sales assisted trial or just trying to uh, think about it from more of a, a user centric perspective and think about the user onboarding and experience a little bit more. So that's the truth. Embrace the messy middle um, that most PLG companies have sales organizations so you don't have to blow up your sales team. Um, like I said, marketers are actually more important, I believe, in the PLG motion than ever before because now marketers have a role in the entire user lifecycle as opposed to just you know, focusing on top of the funnel um, and trying to move those PQLs down, down into sales's hands. Now you're really thinking about a holistic user life cycle. Um, and then the last thing is that, like I said, a lot of people think if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I think PLG is definitely going to move from competitive advantage to necessity because users are going to demand it. They're, the behavior is already changing more and more. Users want to try before they buy. They want to have more of that product education and they can really see through the um, the the kind of like flowery marketing and they can see through the aggressive sell in a in a cold email and um they're you know buyers are becoming more sophisticated and so we have to adapt to that um so going from this journey from sales and marketing led to product led was definitely a bit of a process and so i, I thought about that process a little bit and tried to think of what were some of the key points and key junctures that during our journey and how can I help you make that switch yourself? So I've come up with these five steps for adopting PLG at your company. There are certainly way more than five steps, but when I think about the things that moved the needle for us and helped gain the alignment necessary, helped us educate on the necessary kind of um, new processes, these were the, the five things that rose to the top. And then um, I'm gonna end with a little bit of specific advice for marketers. So the first is getting buy-in, which may seem really obvious, um, but buy-in is, I think, the most important thing, especially if you're on the fence or, or trying to convince a leadership team that product-led growth is right for you. And it's really about alignment and education. And what I mean by that is First, you need to align as a company on what the, the goals are. What are your corporate goals? What is the vision? And what are the goals for the product? Because that will inform what are the things that we need to work on um, and figuring out whether PLG is right for you. I will say PLG is not right for everybody. And um, we don't have enough time to go into why some companies are not suited for PLG. But you know, based on what you know about your company, you'll be able to figure it out whether product can be the primary channel for acquiring and activating and expanding your existing accounts and users. So the uh, so one thing that you need to do once you've got the, the vision set is assess your strengths. Um, so for us, we thought about if we want to build a, a product led go to market and we want to build a product that's self service, um, what are our strengths? And we quickly realized that one of the things we weren't very strong in was self-service onboarding because none of us had done it before because we'd work in enterprise products where there was always a solutions architect and a, and a project team that went and implemented the, the software. And so when we identified that gap in knowledge, we sought to educate ourselves. And one of the ways that we educated ourselves was we ran hundreds and hundreds of white glove onboarding sessions. So where we handheld our users through the onboarding process and we learned a ton. Um, so that was really important to kind of uh, get the education by trying to do it one way to learn how we may do it differently, how we may turn that into a self-service. Um, we also saw education in other forms through courses uh, from organizations like Product Led and Reforge in order to uh, level up our understanding of how you onboard a user and how do you activate them so that they're getting value from your product. And then we aligned on, you know, what are the, the key things that we need to work on first in order to start executing on our product led vision. Um, and then I said rinse and repeat because it wasn't just a one time we got alignment and okay, we're off to the races. 
it really required consistent realignment because as humans, we're naturally inclined to start kind of veering back into what we know and what we're comfortable with. And so there was constant realignment. We held biweekly all hand meetings where we talked about PLG, we talked about our strategy, we talked about what was working, what wasn't working, where we were struggling. And that really helped to kind of solidify PLG within our organization. The second on my list uh, for helping you adopt PLG is thinking in loops and not funnels. Um, and credit goes to Reforge for this uh, graphic. And this really helped align our understanding internally as well on what it meant to be a product-led company. When we think in funnels, we're thinking in organizational silos oftentimes. there's It creates metric silos. Like we talked about, the MQL is the, the be-all, end-all for the marketing team, and the SQL is for the SDRs, and you know so on and so forth. And what it really causes is this like linear thinking that as a marketer, I just need to get people into the top of the funnel. And then as a sales team, I just need to close this deal. And then I don't really care about what the usage of the product is. And so you get into this kind of stuff, the funnel mentality, and you're not thinking cross-functionally. You're not thinking about how your actions at the top of the funnel impact the bottom of the funnel necessarily. Um, and it's totally not sustainable in, in the world of PLG. What you need to do is think in these compounding growth loops. So this is um, a framework that allows you to think about product, your marketing acquisition channels, and your business model all in one framework for growth, where you're not thinking about how you're going to stuff the funnel to improve the, the leads that end up in sales' hands. You're really thinking about how do I activate more people perhaps through the onboarding stage so that sales gets more qualified leads eventually. Um, or thinking about how, how, what channels can I explore where when I acquire one user, I actually acquire, you know, several more because of uh, referrals or some sort of network effect. And so the compounding growth loop really helped us think in that more cross-functional way and, and break down all of those silos within our organization. The third thing that was really important for us was to assemble the squad. So um, whether you're thinking about incubating PLG at your company in a small team first, or you want to go all in, um, either way, there needs to be a team that is responsible. And so for us, that's our growth squad. And it's made up of these roles broadly. Um, so it might look different at your organization, but you do need representatives kind of from each of these departments because this is this is the team that has each of the pieces of the user lifecycle. So you've got product marketing or marketing, product management, you know, someone who's in charge of data analytics, customer success, design and user experience. And the one that's unique here that a lot of marketers are not familiar with is a growth engineer. So this is an engineer who doesn't sit with the engineering team. It's someone who is dedicated to working on growth projects, product-led growth projects, who's going to be working alongside you as a marketer and will even help think about you know, the, the engineering tasks that might be required at the top of the funnel. They're working on things in the product. Um, and you know, the growth engineer typically isn't just focused on code, they're focused on helping you acquire activate and retain users. And, you know, growth engineer is like the single, like most important resource on our team. Um, our growth engineer, Fabian, is on vacation this week. And honestly, I feel like uh, a lot of our work has, has been put on pause because of it. So get yourself a good growth engineer. Um, so the next thing is data. So we had to have a bit of a, a you know, kind of coming together on figuring out our data stack. Um, there was a lot of steps here. There was, you know, getting the customer data platform in place. There was, um, you know, re redefining all of our events that we were tracking for this product-led world. Um, there was trying to bring together our sales data and our marketing data with our product data to create this holistic view. So there was a lot of these steps. The ones that I want to focus on are 
um, the top three here, defining the North Star, your activation rate, and defining your uh, PQLs. And again, we're running out of time, so I'm not gonna be able to go into depth. So we'll, we'll have to do another session on that. But um, one of the lessons learned was define a North Star that correlates to value for your user. So it, early on, we kind of thought our North Star, we're an early stage company, should be something around user growth, it should be revenue. Um, and what we quickly realized is that in order to align the team on working on the right things, our North Star needed to be focused on how do users get value. So Charlie is a unified workspace for content management. And, you know, we thought about looking at our best fit users, these are the, the users that uploaded the most amount of content. And we saw a direct correlation between the amount of content a user uploaded and their success in the platform. And so our North Star metric is now content under management. And it's tied directly to how users get value, which helps inform the projects that we work on. Um, that is also tied to our activation rate. So like I said, the best fit users are the ones that upload the most content. They're the ones who have the most success. So that also informs how we define our activation rate, which is the moment when a user gets value in your product. And then finally, that activation rate then informs PQLs. So product qualified leads, which are different than marketing qualified leads, but same concept. Um, some amount of behavior in the product qualifies a lead to get um, kind of you know, bumped into sales's radar so that sales should go and have the conversation with this lead, similar to MQLs. But the difference with PQLs is that the, the signals, I think, are much stronger. The characteristics that you're getting from that user are much more robust than an MQL because they're using the product, they're getting value. Um, the exact definition may be different depending on um, your your company, like maybe it's maximum team size in their in their plan has been reached or or something else, like raising their hand during the trial. The final step in in this is prioritization. And um, so here are the three things I would say that you need to do in order to hit the ground running. First is define your objectives and how you're going to measure success. Um, so this is obviously really important because if you don't have this, then how are you going to go back to your leadership team and say, you know, this is working? Step two is brainstorm your ideas that help you reach the ideal state. So based on those objectives, where do you wanna be? Um, and I say ideal state because you don't wanna dilute your ideas too early because you'll get into this mode of incremental optimizations. And that's not what you wanna do, you wanna move the needle. But so you have to think about the ideal state. In step three, when you prioritize your experiments, you can break them down into smaller chunks of work. So think about the ideal state and then think, what, what can I do in three weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks? And that will help you then prioritize those experiments, show incremental value on your product-led experiments, but also be tracking towards this big goal. I'm just conscious of time here, so I'm gonna skip to one of my um, last slides, which is specific advice for marketers that are on this session. Um, Product-led growth is new, it's really exciting, but I would say that great product-led companies lean into some really key marketing strengths. Um, so some of those things are user segmentation is really important in product-led growth. Um, so as marketers, we're uniquely positioned to kind of take ownership of that. So knowing our users, knowing how they're segmented, knowing which cohorts are um, activating on the product at the highest rates. Those are all things that we as marketers can bring to the table in a product led world. Um, brand is even more powerful because uh, brand is a, a moat. It's a competitive advantage for a lot of companies. And so, um, your your brand is in your product as well so like how do you bring your brand voice into the product oftentimes in a sales-led company you might not even think about that your brand is on the website it's in your events it's not in the product but now you have an opportunity to bring brand into the product you know have fun in the product with your brand um 
using uh, your your storytelling and your narrative to build a community and build a movement. Though that's a huge opportunity in PLG for marketers. And then finally, I think positioning is so so critical because no amount of product led growth strategy for your go to market is going to solve for bad positioning. And so, you know, marketers need to have a seat at the table. The positioning needs to be really clear, and then it needs to be really obvious when a user first signs into your product, who you are, who your competitors are, and like, where do you fit into the ecosystem? So I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, I know I went a little bit over time, Gotham, apologies, but I'm really passionate about PLG um, and would love to see if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Sandy. Yeah, so since this is the last session, you have the flexibility to go a few minutes after time, so that's fine. Okay, so we have one question from the audience. I'll, I'll quickly push it to the stage. There you go. Okay, so we have a super focused account-based marketing strategy for our enterprise ICPs, which is working great, but we want to try PLG for our SMB audience as they can grow into our customers. How to achieve it without overstretching your existing bandwidth? That is a great question. Um, and I actually think uh, your previous experience with ABM and focusing on you know, these enterprise ICPs is going to help you figure out PLG for that SMB audience. Um, I would say that you want to be really targeted with which, which slice of SMB you're thinking about. Because um, if you're trying to go for like, you know, this really broad group with your product led strategy, um, that's going to definitely stretch your bandwidth. So I would think about um, where, how are these SMB users going to help me achieve my corporate goals, my product vision? How does it help, uh, you know, how does it feed into our enterprise ABM strategy? And then pick the audiences, like I would say, start with one, you know, kind of pick one cohort that you can focus on and focus your efforts there so you don't overstretch yourself. Um, you know, there's probably a ton of other things that you could be doing here, uh, but I would just say like that user segmentation piece is super important. All right, we have one question. Yeah, we can wind up after this. I'll project this on stage as well. How do you enable PLG for products that require custom solutioning where value cannot be realized without tailing, tailoring the product to some degree? Awesome question. And this is a perfect question to kind of speak to the messy middle. Um, so you don't need to have a freemium or a free trial necessarily. It would be great if you can work towards it, but it doesn't need to be the thing you do on day one. Um, I would say that one of the things you can think about is how can you make the, the onboarding and user experience in that custom solutioning process more seamless for your user and give them more value early on in that process. Like, is there any way that you can you can bring forward some of the value that the user is going to get once they have this custom solution product earlier on in their user lifecycle? Um, I would also say there, there are some tools out there now. Um, one of the ones that I heard of is called Novatic, and they allow you to create what feels like a free version of your product. So it feels like you're getting this free trial, but really it's more of a um, kind of demo, but it's a demo that's self-guided. Um, and so that could be an interesting way for you to enable PLG for your product. So give on your website this, um, this almost uh, like self-guided demo. And so users can go and experience a little bit of the product before the paywall. Um, Another way to achieve that is also think about what are the things that your user cares about that are maybe adjacent to your product's value? Um, are there any things in that realm that you can offer for free? Um, this is called a sidecar app, if you want to kind of research this on your own. Um, and HubSpot does it really well. So HubSpot's main product, marketing automation or CRM, um, is uh, is one thing, but a lot of us marketers have other needs like email signatures in our in our emails or creating a logo. So HubSpot created all these free products like an email generator and a logo generator. And that was just ways to get brand interaction and, and 
some level of product interaction before the paywall to help users kind of get into your ecosystem and really get that feeling of I've had a little bit of product experience. So we have something on the chat. Uh, Kevin asks, what's the name of this tool? Um, Kevin, can you do, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's um, Nevatic. I, I believe it's N-A-V-A-T-T-I-C. All right, great. So that brings us to the end of the session and the conference. Thank you so much, Sandy, for your time. It was a really uh, informative session. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time out for us. And for the attendees, a big thank you for being a part of SaaS Insiders Marketing 2021. Take care, stay safe, and have a good day and a good night. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Gautam.